Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. Christmas. It's the most wonderful time of the year for some of us, but it isn't the easiest time of the year for many of us. For members of the LGBTQ community, Christmas can be a lonely holiday or a stifling one, especially for those in the Deep South. Gay bars can be a haven, a place to be with your friends and feel loved if you are alone, or a place to escape to after a stressful visit with your family. The Drama Club in Homo, Louisiana was a wonderful refuge for the gay community until Christmas Eve in 2009 when the beloved bartender and manager, Robert LeCompte, was viciously stabbed to death after closing. His murder shattered the small, close-knit community. It was a robbery cloaked as a hate crime, but the damage was done. The club closed about four years later. Welcome to episode 36, Christmas Eve at the Drama Club, the murder of Robert LeCompte. Situated about an hour southwest of New Orleans, Homa is known as Louisiana's Bayou Country. It's located in Terrebonne Parish, and for anyone who isn't sure what a parish is or why it's called that, it's basically a county, but Louisiana was originally Roman Catholic under both France and Spain's rule. The boundaries dividing the territories generally corresponded with church parishes. In 1807, the territorial legislature officially adopted the ecclesiastical term for their counties. Terrebon is the second largest parish in Louisiana, and it has been the center for Cajun culture since the 18th century. Terra Bon is French for good earth, as early settlers found the soil to be rich and fertile. About 5% of the parish still speaks French or some form of it. There was a flood of French colonists to the area following the French and Indian War, also known as the Seven Years' War. And in 1760, French colonists from Acadia, which is modern-day Nova Scotia, settled in Terrebonne after being ousted by the British in the same war. This is where the word Cajun was born. Say Acadian fast and with a Bayou accent. Acadian. Acajun. Cajun. Cajun. In 1834, Terrebonne Parish founded the city of Homa for a more centrally located parish seat. It was near the former settlement of the Homa tribe of Native Americans. Centered at the convergence of six bayous, it provided better access for trade transportation in the canals created by the settlers. In 1848, Homa was incorporated as a city, and by that time was also booming with industry mainly from sugarcane plantations dependent on African-American slaves, but also seafood, logging, and fur trading were prevalent for non-slave owners. And while the largest sugar mill at the historic South Down Plantation was dismantled and shipped to Guatemala in 1979, the other industries survived and thrived. The discovery of oil and natural gas resources in the late 1920s kicked off what would become Homa's largest industry. By the 70s, Homa's focus was oil, which led to a devastating economic depression in the early 80s when the U.S. became dependent on cheaper foreign oil. For almost two years, the unemployment rate was at 25%. Homa diversified to survive, becoming a tourist destination for the authentic Cajun culture and food, the plantation homes that became museums, the wildlife attractions, and, of course, its close proximity to New Orleans. In 2009, when Robert LeCompte was murdered, many Homa locals were still struggling and felt that their Cajun heritage was fading. Like the rest of the Deep South, the area has become more Republican and more Protestant. For a young man like Robert LeCompte, Homa wasn't an easy place to make a living. With a population of about 35,000, the main industry was oil rig work. LeCompte, born in Homa in 1970, was a small, diminutive man, only standing five foot two inches. He wasn't made for that type of work. And Robert was not only out of the closet, but he was HIV positive and refused to hide it. With the oil industry not an option, that left food service and retail. But employers found his HIV status to be a liability, and he struggled to hold down a job. That is until Randy Chestnut came to town and opened up Drama Club. At Drama Club, 
Dancers and drag queens performed on a wide stage backed by velvet curtains and high top tables as disco balls turned, shimmering on the dancing patrons while the DJ spun records in an overhead booth. It was magical, and it was truly welcoming to all, not just the gay community. The clever and catchy slogan invited customers to bring your mama and your drama. Straight people often came to watch the show, dance the night away, and enjoy the drink served by everyone's favorite bartender, Robert LeCompte. Robert hadn't grown up with the best home life. His dad took off and moved to Florida when he was still in grade school, and his mother was said to be very controlling and needy. He lived at home until he was in his early 20s, turning over all his paychecks to help support the family. He had a younger sister named Nicole, but he was the sort of guy that everyone just loved. His childhood friend, Jesse Dufresne, characterized him as the most upbeat and optimistic person he had ever known. According to a piece in Vanity Fair, his friend said that Robert had a habit of running up to you, jumping up, and wrapping his legs around you. It was funny and endearing. He was affectionate, always happy, and very loyal to his friends. He is also characterized in that article as, quote, very, very gay, even before he was out. He was effeminate and flamboyant. He didn't own a car until his late thirties, so he speed walked everywhere he went, always cheerful and smiling, shouting hey girl to his friends. Randy Chestnut said he was the best bartender he ever had. He and Robert became really close friends and were roommates up until Robert's death. Randy had owned several bars in other parts of the state before and was well-traveled. He took Robert on road trips with him and showed him another world. They went to the Gay Pride Festival, Southern Decadence, and Robert vowed to carry the rainbow banner the next year. Randy is also gay, and is also HIV positive. There was a romantic relationship briefly between the two men, but it was fleeting and did not hurt their friendship at all. Robert worked hard at Drama Club, working his way up to manager. And when Randy was ill, he ran the place like it was his own. Randy Chestnut later said his intention was to leave Drama Club to Robert if anything ever happened to him. Christmas Eve of 2009 was Robert LeCompte's 39th birthday. He often said he wanted to be Peter Pan and not turn 40. Unfortunately, he would get his wish. At this time, I'm going to pause and hear a word from one of our sponsors. As I said in the opening, Christmas time can be difficult for members of the LGBTQ community. Whether they are out or not, it can be lonely and stressful. Drama Club was always a haven for the gays in Homer, and especially on Christmas Eve. But Christmas Eve 2009 was even more festive because they were also celebrating Robert's birthday. It was a rollicking party. Photos later shown to the Sheriff's Department showed a bar full of people laughing and dancing the night away and Robert was grinning from ear to ear, happy and cheerful, pouring drinks for his friends, and having a wonderful birthday. But by 1.30 a.m., only seven customers remained, including a young African-American man named Jarrell Young. He was 23 years old, but he already had two kids, and he was a former employee of Drama Club and still liked to come and hang out. There were whispers that Jarrell and Robert had hooked up in the past, despite Jarrell's heterosexual relationships. And that evening, witnesses saw the two being flirty and definitely saw Robert giving Jarrell free drinks. Jarrell Young also had a difficult upbringing. He grew up almost an hour away from Homa and Bayou Lafourche. His father also left his family when he was young. His mother, Nellie Young, was characterized as negligent and yet overbearing. She factors in heavily in his later life and this story. Jarrell had an older brother, Dante, and two sisters. He and Dante were three years apart and close, but both had a violent streak that started early in life. When they were eight and five, they were playing, and Dante stabbed Jarrell in the face. Jarrell grew up blind in one eye. But despite the troubled home life, Jarrell did well in school. He ran track and was a good student, and was considered much calmer than his hot-headed brother. Dante was constantly getting into fights. And Dante was also bigger than him, 
better looking, and more charismatic. He was prom king, and he, like Robert LeCompte, was gay and very flamboyant. After graduating high school, Dante started dancing at Drama Club. He began as a stripper, and then moved up to perform in the drag show with the stage name Sierra Knight. Randy Chestnut said Dante was a lot of fun and a hell of a dancer. Dante even moved in with Randy for a while. Before Robert was his longtime roommate, he often let employees rent his extra room, and Dante lived with him for almost two years until he moved in with his own boyfriend. Jarrell first came to Drama Club in 2004 with his sister, Kateria, to see Dante perform. Jarrell followed Dante to Homa after he graduated and started hanging out at the club. He also took advantage of Randy's spare room. He worked part-time jobs around town, but never had much steady work. Randy hired him on at the club since he was around all the time anyway. Jarrell reportedly also had a sexual relationship with Randy Chestnut, though he would later insist he only let Randy perform oral sex on him. Later, Robert and Randy weren't the only other gay men that Jarrell was rumored to have slept with. Randy did admit it was mainly tricking, that the young man was having sex for money or free drinks. But Jarrell was not a known troublemaker. Everyone liked the kid. Dante, on the other hand, was always in trouble. Randy had to fire him after Dante hit his boyfriend so hard he knocked his arm out of socket. His boyfriend was the DJ, and they were both at work when it happened. Then in 2008, Dante was convicted of felony child molestation for molesting his 13-year-old cousin. He denied it ever happened, but he served his time, and then some, having trouble securing a landlord with his felony conviction. But regarding his brother's sexual orientation, Dante seemed to be a bit naive, or at least in denial. He said he just didn't see it. But Randy Chestnut insists that Jarrell was bisexual. He said everyone knew it, too. Jarrell later adamantly denied it, saying, quote, I'm not bisexual, lisexual, trisexual, or sci-fi sexual. He also denied ever tricking or having sex for money. And to be fair, he had a serious girlfriend during that whole time, with whom he had his first son in 2007. In 2008, he began dating a white woman named Darkus Baker. She was pregnant with his second child within a month. Three months later, Jarrell was arrested for domestic violence and illegal possession of weapons. The charges were dismissed. Darkus would have a history of calling the police, reporting abuse, only to have a change of heart and ask to drop the charges. Five months later, he did it again. This time, Jarrell was charged for drug possession, for cocaine and weed, and also for another weapons charge. And this time, Darkus reported that Jarrell had put the back of a knife to her throat and that he had also superglued her daughter's lizards and stabbed them. Also, an arrest report from one officer on scene had a six-page edition detailing Jarrell's obsession with edged weapons. He had all kinds of knives, a bayonet, and a pistol with a serial number scratched off. Incredibly, again, the charges were dropped. I don't really understand this. I do understand it was Darkus's choice whether or not to pursue her domestic violence complaint, but why they kept dropping the serious weapons and drug charges is beyond me. The detail about the lizards is disturbing. We know that Jarrell was violent with his girlfriend. We know he had a violent upbringing. And we all know that a lot of murderers were abused as children, and they often start small, abusing animals or loved ones before they actually kill. And the thing about Robert LeCompte's murder, which baffled police, was that it was so violent and gruesome. It was up close and personal. The type of murder we think of as a rage killing. So Robert had to have known his killer. He had to have been close to him. And now I'm going to pause to hear a final word from our sponsors. At around 2 a.m. on what was then Christmas Day morning, Robert was closing up Drama Club. As he always did, he called Randy Chestnut to let him know he was locking up and heading home. By 2.30 a.m., when he hadn't shown up, Randy was concerned. He tried calling Robert's cell phone and got no answer. He called the club's landline. Still no answer. 
Randy even tried calling another employee to see if maybe Robert had made other plans. He didn't get an answer. Finally, at 3.22 a.m., Randy Chestnut called the Sheriff's Department. Terrebonne Parish Sheriff's Deputy Dustin Crabtree arrived at Drama Club at 3.44 a.m. He walked right into the unlocked front door of the club and immediately spotted Robert lying in a pool of blood near the bar. Detective Lieutenant Terry Degra was on the scene by 4.15 a.m., and the crime scene investigation was underway. There was so much blood, there was no way to tell at the scene just how many times Robert had been stabbed. At around 5.15 a.m., in a highly unprofessional move, a sheriff's department employee posted on Facebook, quote, Robert LeCompte passed away, R.I.P. And this is how Robert's family found out. His sister Nicole rushed to the scene but was not allowed in until Robert's body was removed. I find it strange that she was allowed in at all. She took a bunch of cell phone pictures of the bloody scene and even snagged a photograph of her brother from the wall. So much for keeping a closed crime scene. Officers had very little to go on, so you would think they would want to secure that scene for as long as possible to gather evidence. But they released it back to Randy Chestnut by 6 a.m. Officers did note that there was no sign of forced entry, and after questioning Randy, they found out that about $4,000 in cash from the bar drawer and poker machine was missing. But the piece of evidence that was the most disturbing was a cocktail napkin soaked in Robert's blood found beneath his body. There were words written on it. It read, You gave me AIDS. Naturally, this made Robert's murder look like a hate crime especially considering the viciousness of the attack. The murder seemed personal, and there was one piece of evidence that practically had a name on it. Right outside of the office where the cash was kept bundled in Capital One bank wraps was a receipt laying on the floor. It was a cash receipt for adding minutes to a cell phone, and the cell phone number was right there on the receipt. It was Jarrell Young's phone number. But despite the circumstantial clue, the Sheriff's Department had little else to go on. The drama club had no security cameras or even a bouncer. They had never needed one. And Robert often closed up alone. It's why he always called Randy to let him know when he was leaving. Nearby businesses had security cameras, but they didn't reach far enough to capture drama club's front door. I mentioned there were seven people at the bar right before closing earlier. That would be Dwayne Clark and Jacob Chauvin, who both had cars there, as well as George Trosclair, Craig Pennison, Johnny Bilio, and Jarrell Young. As Robert was cleaning up, Dwayne Clark and the rest of the guys piled up in his car and went to eat at a nearby Waffle House. They came back to Drama Club at 3 a.m. so Jacob could pick up his car, and they noticed that Robert's car was still in the lot. They all would later testify that they assumed that Robert and Jarrell were hooking up, and that Robert must have left with Jarrell. So they minded their own business and went home. But they were all positive that not only was Jarrell the last person seen with Robert, but that it was Jarrell's SUV that was in the parking lot when they left for Waffle House. And the SUV was gone when they got back at 3 a.m. They had all seen Robert flirting with Jarrell and giving him free drinks. They had no reason to think that anything else was going on. Even Nicole, Robert's sister, said that Robert would often hook up after closing. No one found any of this unusual or concerning. A girl named Misty Brio said she was at another bar called All Star Lounge on Christmas Eve, and a little before 2 a.m., she decided to go to Drama Club, but the front door was locked. She saw the same cars that the men in Drama Club testified to. Jacob's car, Robert's, and Jarrell's silver SUV. It was Darkest Baker's SUV, but we'll get to that. At 3 a.m., Jarrell was caught on security footage, pumping gas at a nearby gas station. Later at trial, Misty Brio identified the SUV, and the men from the drama club identified Jarrell on the tape as well. So Detective Terry Degra had these two sightings to go on. Eyewitnesses put Jarrell Young as the last person to be seen with Robert LeCompte, and Jarrell Young's phone receipt was found on the floor in drama club. Detective Degra interviewed Jarrell Young on December 26th, the day after the murder. Jarrell claimed he had left drama club before anyone drove out of the parking lot contrary to what the other eyewitnesses had said. Jarrell admitted that he knew Robert was HIV positive, though he lied about ever working at Drama Club. 
remember, he was no longer an employee when Robert was murdered. Randy Chestnut would later testify that Jarrell had asked him for a loan just a week before the murder, and he had turned him down. When Degra pushed him about this lie, he told him he just didn't want the police to think he had killed Robert LeCompte because he needed the money. Randy Chestnut also later testified that all of his employees, including ex-employees, would know where the money bags and petty cash were kept in his office. So Jarrell would have known where the money was. He just needed to get past Robert to get it. Detective Degra said he never brought up the missing money to Jarrell, that Jarrell just brought it up on his own. When Degra asked Jarrell who he thought killed Robert, such a popular figure in Homa and the gay community, Jarrell said it was probably somebody who was angry with Robert because he had given them AIDS. No one but the police knew about the blood-soaked napkin found under Robert's body that had written on it, You Gave Me AIDS. And yet Jarrell brought it up himself. But other than this, the detective had no physical evidence linking Jarrell to the crime. The weapon was never found, and Jarrell's blood wasn't found anywhere in the club. Nevertheless, he later said he knew Jarrell did it. He just couldn't prove it. So he watched and he waited. Randy Chestnut was concerned that his friend's murder would be swept under the rug, but Degra promised him that he had no intention of letting the case go. By all accounts, including the Vanity Fair article, Detective Terry Degra worked sensitively and respectfully with the small gay community in Homa. He gained their trust, and he was determined not to let them down. And on April 1st, he finally caught a break. Darkus Baker called in and asked to speak with him, saying, quote, It's about that little gay boy who was killed at the drama club. She was hysterical on the phone and said she was terrified of Jarrell and his mother and sister. Detective Degra immediately got in his squad car to go see Darkus, who was living with her grandparents. Darkus told him about the last time she talked to Jarrell on Christmas Eve. Darkus told him that the last time she spoke with Jarrell on Christmas Eve was around midnight, and she was pissed. He had taken her silver SUV earlier in the day to supposedly go Christmas shopping, but had never come back. He took her calls for a while, but then finally screamed at her that if she didn't leave him alone, she wouldn't get her Christmas present. And then he never answered the cell phone again that night. Early on Christmas morning, at first light, Jarrell showed up at Darkus' grandparents' house. He called her and told her to come outside. She said he gave her a Walmart bag, tied up tightly. He then told Darkus Baker that he had killed someone so that they could be together as a family. He admitted to his girlfriend that he stabbed Robert LeCompte with a screwdriver, later tossing the screwdriver out on a back road. He also showed her a wooden keychain with the name Robert carved on it. Darka said that Jarrell told her that Robert's last words were, Why? Why? Why me? I thought I was your friend. He told Darkus to get rid of the Walmart bag and keychain for him, but for now to just hide them in her grandparents' house so she could leave with him right then and take care of the money. Jarrell showed her the money he had stolen from Drama Club. It was mainly one, five, and ten dollar bills wrapped in Capital One bank wrappers, with a few twenties and hundred dollar bills as well. Jarrell and Darkus took the money to Nellie Young's trailer, Jarrell's mother. They hid it in the light fixtures. Jarrell told Darkus to burn what was in that bag and Robert's keychain. But when Darkus went back to her grandparents' house, she decided to just hide the stuff in the back of her closet. The missing blue drama club t-shirt, covered in Robert LeCompte's blood, was what was in the Walmart bag. Despite now having this windfall of money, Jarrell told his girlfriend that they had to wait to spend it. They planned to rent a house together, but he knew it would look suspicious if they did it right away, especially paying with small bills. They waited until the beginning of February in 2010, and Darkus told their new landlord that they were paying in small bills because she made that money waitressing. Later, at trial, the landlord would corroborate this, explaining that the first month's rent of $700 was paid in cash with $5 and $10 bills. Also, the phone number listed on the rental application matched the phone number found on the receipt at Drama Club. During this time after Robert's murder, the relationship between Darkus and Nellie Young had deteriorated into violence. Jarrell once had to step between the two women during a physical fight where Darkus had been holding his daughter Bella. He suffered a knife wound on his hand when he intervened. To characterize Nellie Young as toxic and violent is an understatement. 
She was a very vindictive woman. After Darkus spoke with Detective Degra, Jarrell Young was immediately arrested. In the months before the trial, Darkus would later report that Nellie and Kateria threatened her and her children if she didn't recant her story. And Darkus continued to call and go see Jarrell while he awaited trial. In June of 2010, in a call that the two of them would know was being recorded, Jarrell said that a man named Jeremiah Washington was the real killer. He told Darkus to tell the police that she had been drunk and pissed at him for cheating when she accused him of killing Robert LeCompte. And he had cheated on her. And this would damage her credibility at trial. She went to the police on April 1st. But on March 31st, she had found text messages on Jarrell's phone with another woman. She went to the woman's house and found him there. He didn't deny it and, in fact, got violent with Darkus again. He chased her out to her car, pulled her out of it, and then drug her down the street by her hair as her pants and underwear slid off. She screamed for help, but no one intervened. So yes, it didn't look great that she turned him in the day after this incident. But I need to point out that Darkus was also taking a risk by going to the police. She told Detective Degra that after Jarrell had once again assaulted her, this time in the middle of the day in front of witnesses who did nothing, she just couldn't take it anymore. So she went home and decided to open that Walmart bag that she was supposed to burn. When she saw the blood on the Drama Club t-shirt, she said she prayed and then she told her grandparents what had happened. She then signed paperwork transferring custody of her oldest child to her grandparents in case she went to jail. Back in December, when Jarrell told her what he had done and made her take the Walmart bag, he also told her that she was now an accomplice. She had evidence, and she was going to benefit from the money. He wasn't wrong, but the district attorney decided to grant Darkus Baker immunity to testify against Jarrell Young. But as I said before, Darkus did keep seeing Jarrell while he was in jail, and by the end of June, she did try to recant her story. The guy that Jarrell was trying to set up, named Jeremiah Washington, was an ex-boyfriend of Darkus's. No one believed this story, and Jeremiah had an alibi. So Jarrell Young went to trial in late December of 2012. Darkus Baker struggled on the witness stand. She had recanted once before, and she did wait months to report what she knew. But the prosecutor did a really good job of walking Darkus through all of the abuse she had suffered at the hands of Jarrell Young. Aside from the March 31st assault that had prompted Darkus to turn him in, there were two other domestic violence arrests and restraining orders. Jarrell Young was usually able to apologize and sweet-talk her into dropping the charges, but the arrest record still proved it happened. Darkus also testified that he was controlling to the point of paranoia that he was always depressed and told her he had demons inside of him. She said he kept cameras and recording devices all over the house to watch her when he wasn't there. Jarrell bought her a cell phone, but dictated the times that she could use it, often taking it with him when he left the house. Also, remember Darkus had had a baby around this time, so she was financially dependent on Jarrell Young for herself and her children. And you've got to consider the emotional factor. She isn't the first woman to accept the apologies from her abuser. And because Darkus Baker loved Jarrell Young, she would forgive him. We see this all the time, and it's easy to blame the victim and ask why she didn't just leave. But these cases aren't that simple. There often is still love, and she had a child with him. In court, she said, quote, He could make me say or do anything he wanted. That's how much I loved him. And also at trial, the prosecutor was able to get even more reasoning on why she recanted. Darkus testified that Jarrell's mother Nellie and sister Kateria were calling her all the time and threatening her. Also, Desiree Petra, the woman Jarrell had cheated on Darkus with, was also threatening her and her children. Desiree told her that she would find her and beat her up, but Kateria was even more vile in her threats. She told Darkus she would kill her, cut her up, and feed her to her own baby. Darkus was under a lot of pressure to take back what she said, both from the man she loved and from the violence threatened by his family. It's not surprising that she was scared and changed her story. However, though Darkus didn't come off great at the trial, Jarrell Young was his own worst enemy. He testified and denied killing Robert LeCompte, writing the note, or stealing the money. 
He said he came to Drama Club that night just for the free drinks. He explained his receipt being found on the floor close to the office by pointing out that the bathroom was also close to the office and he had used it right before leaving the club. He insisted he was in the bathroom when the other men left to go to Waffle House and that's why they assumed he stayed with Robert. When asked to explain why it took an hour to get to the gas station where he was caught on security footage at 3 a.m., he said he was really drunk and had taken back roads and was driving recklessly and kept driving off the road. The gas station was less than 20 minutes from Drama Club. If he really left when he said he did, he should have been there on camera no later than 2.20 a.m. Jarrell also doubled down on his accusation against Jeremiah Washington. He claimed that Jeremiah went to visit Darkus and that they sat in her car smoking weed and Jeremiah gave her the bloodstained t-shirt from Drama Club. He said Darkus just accused him because she was mad at him for cheating. He insisted it was Mr. Washington and pointed out that she agreed with him on the tape jailhouse phone call. But District Attorney Jason DeGate went hard on Jarrell on the stand. He questioned him in detail about all of the domestic assault reports from Darkus Baker, especially incidents that happened on November 4th, 2008 and April 8th, 2009. During the November incident, Jarrell had held a gun to Darkus's head. He didn't deny this on the stand. And as for April of 2009, Jarrell Young had taken a BB gun and shot Darkus about 20 times on her legs, leaving them covered with bruises and welts. There were witnesses to this. Again, Jarrell didn't deny it, though he did claim it was a toy gun and he used plastic pellets. District Attorney DeGate also cross-examined him extensively about his movements on the night of Robert's murder. Jarrell tried to stick to his story, but he did a lot of stuttering, backtracking, and confused a lot of names and times. Darkus Baker may not have been the ideal witness, but she came off a hell of a lot better than Jarrell Young did on his own behalf. Though he tried to explain everything, there was just no denying that witnesses proved he was the last person seen with Robert LeCompte, that it was his phone receipt that was found on the floor. And worst of all, that he made a statement about the murderer to Detective Degra that whoever killed Robert probably did it because Robert gave them AIDS. The blood-soaked cocktail napkin with the words, You gave me AIDS written on it, was not public knowledge. It was just too coincidental that Jarrell brought this up. He even put it in his written statement. In early December of 2012, almost three years after Robert's murder, Jarrell Young was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison with hard labor. And as soon as his verdict was read, sheriff's deputies stood up and arrested Nellie and Kateria Young for intimidating a witness. They also put out a warrant for Desiree Petra. This was planned all along. They just needed Darkus' statement on record to arrest the women. If convicted, they all faced up to 40 years in prison. But all of the women took plea deals, each just serving a few months. Jarrell Young had done his best to make this look like a hate crime or some sort of vengeance. But really, it was robbery and one of convenience. Whether he planned it in advance or not, Jarrell knew how much cash would be at Drama Club that night, and he knew where it was kept. He probably knew that Robert LeCompte was not only a trusting and sweet guy, but he was also attracted to him. And he did need the money. He had been fired from a part-time construction job just a week before, and that day, his final paycheck of less than $100 had arrived in the mail. I think he sat on that bar stool brooding about money, possibly coked up and getting drunker as the night went on. So he formulated a plan. Once everyone left, he jumped up and blitzed Robert LeCompte, probably coming from behind. Robert suffered at least 13 stab wounds to his back and neck. The coroner said it wasn't a knife that was used, but something more like a screwdriver. This corroborates Darkus' story of what Jarrell told her he used to kill Robert. At trial, the defense even argued that Robert's dying words, Why me? I thought I was your friend, were made up. It's possible, but I don't think so. Darkus told the truth about everything else. The defense said he couldn't have said this if he was being stabbed in the neck. I counter that he was probably stabbed in the back first, and it's possible that Jarrell started viciously stabbing his throat to shut him up. So no, this was a robbery. But I'm not sure we can completely dismiss it as a hate crime. The self-hate and loathing in a repressed homosexual or bisexual man is very real. 
especially for men of color. Jarrell had sex with Robert LeCompte before, so in a way, this was very personal. But for the record, it was established at Jarrell Young's trial that neither he nor Darkus Baker were HIV positive. Robert LeCompte was a 39-year-old beloved friend, son, brother, uncle, and human being, and he died a horrific death at the hands of someone he trusted in his favorite place to be, Drama Club, a place where he had found work, a place where he made friends and was accepted for who he was. After his death, business dropped steeply, especially until Jarrell Young was arrested. The small gay community wasn't only in mourning, they were terrified that there was someone out there targeting them. Randy Chestnut vowed publicly to keep Drama Club open, that he didn't want the gay community relegated to the backwoods dark bars embarrassed to be themselves. And he did try. But Drama Club closed in February of 2014, just a little over four years after Robert's murder. One article said that the BP oil spill had hurt all businesses in the area and didn't even mention Robert's murder. Other articles point out that online dating options and the increased acceptance of the LGBTQ community also contributed to the closing of Drama Club. Homa's gay community no longer needed its own haven. And indeed, a newer bar with a back porch overlooking Bayou Terrebonne opened up around the time that Drama Club closed. It's called Main Street Lounge. Everyone came to the new hotspot, gays and straights alike, and blacks and whites alike. It's an inclusive place where when the lights go down, anyone can be found sparkling under the glitter ball, gyrating to the thumping bass, being themselves, and having a blast. Robert LeCompte would have loved it. Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. Today's episode is also brought to you by my longtime patron and friend, Lynn Cummings. Thank you so much for your support, Lynn. I could not do this without the generosity of patrons like you. As always, if you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. You can also listen directly from Spreaker, my network online, or on their app. And I'm also on Stitcher, CastBox, and many other podcatchers. If you're interested in supporting the show, I have a Patreon page with many different rewards for different levels of donation. Or you can just visit my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com, where you can make a one-time donation just by hitting the donate button. I also have a merchandise store open. Just go to whatamaneuver.net and click on Shop by Store, then search for Southern Fried True Crime. I have all sorts of t-shirts, tanks, hoodies, and even onesies for babies. If you have any comments, corrections, or suggestions, you can email me at southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I love hearing from you guys, and I'm always looking for new cases, so please feel free to reach out. I'm also all over social media. Just search the show name in your favorite platform if you'd like to connect with me there. If you're interested in discussing the Robert LeConte case or any other episodes further, come check out my discussion group. It's linked to my main Southern Fried True Crime Facebook page. And we don't just discuss cases. We share memes, make friends, and even recently debated the pronunciation of the word pecan. I'm interested to see what the group makes of my Cajun pronunciations in this episode. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.